My name is Aaron Golub. I'm a professor in urban studies and planning here at Portland State, and I'll be introducing, and then Jason Anderson, my colleague from civil engineering, will moderate the session. I don't know, do you want to introduce yourself now? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm Jason Anderson, and uh, I'm the civil engineering faculty for, for this particular course. So our seminars have been a tradition here at PSU since uh, the year 2000. These seminars are once again held here live and simulcast on from Portland State University's urban campus, located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Motlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It's important to acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors of this place, Remember these communities and honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Great. Uh, today, we are pleased to have Lewis and Lem presenting on Port of Portland's Marine Terminal 6 Contribution to Regional Economic Development. Lewis and Lem, who I've known for almost 20 years, and I'm honored to uh, introduce him, received his, Dr. Lem, received his PhD in transportation planning from UCLA with a focus on transportation economics and finance. He has previously worked as a transportation economist when the, with the U.S. Governmental um, Accountability Office, the U.S. EPA, the uh, American Automobile Association of Northern California, Nevada, and Utah. For many years, he worked as a consultant in transportation planning and economics, including, including at Parsons Brinkerhoff, which is now part of WSP. Lewison currently works at the Port of Portland in Portland, Oregon, where he is responsible for managing and administering transportation planning programs and federal and state infrastructure grants for the port's multimodal transportation business unit in marine aviation, industrial lands, and navigation. Before we begin, I just want to give you a little preview of some of our upcoming speakers for the fall series. And again, these are every Friday at the same time. As an overview of how we'll go today, um, you can expect our speaker to speak for about 40 minutes. We'll have some Q&A. You can enter questions and answers through the chat on your um, control panel for those outside of the room. We'll also have some Q&A probably from folks here in the room. Um, if we run out of time for all of your questions, we'll, we'll pass them to our speakers uh, and they possibly can get back to you by email of we have enabled closed captioning, but you must click on the closed captioning feature on your control panel to view them. We will also be recording today's webinar. It will be available on our website later today along with the presentation slides. If you are tracking professional development hours, uh, the webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Afterwards, for students in the class, um, please just hold on after the speaker in the Q&A. Jason and I will go through just some quick procedures for you and walk you through the Canvas site for the class. Thanks for holding on for that. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Lem. Thank you. Does that work? Here we are. So thank you, Aaron. Um, I hope that's working. Um, Aaron, and I, yeah, Aaron and I have known each other for a few years. Um, so I'm really happy to be back here at Portland State University. And um, thank you for all the folks at Portland State um, for having me to come back. Um, this is actually the first talk I've given since COVID. So I'm, I'm a little bit out of practice. Um, but I was, um, oh, yeah, here we go. So that's, that's great. No, just a couple of disclaimers. Um, so I was looking back, actually. Portland State has this amazing archive of previous transportation seminars. Um, so I would look back to see when I was here. And it's, <laughs> it's a little surprising. So I was here in 2004. Um, <laughs> and then I was here in 2008 and 2010, and now it's hard to believe it's 2022. Um, so I'm so happy to be back, and um, let's talk about um, cargo. So. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we're here in Portland and I work at the Port of Portland. Um, so I'm here to talk about Terminal 6. This is just a little bit of information to get you oriented to uh, Terminal 6 um, and what's unique about Terminal 6. Um, the Port of Portland um, has a number of facilities, but I'm just focusing today on here in purple, um, Terminal 6, which is actually uh, the newest of the marine terminals. There's some older marine terminals um, closer into downtown, closer into the, on the Willamette River. Uh, Terminal 6 is right at the head of the peninsula where the Columbia River and the Willamette meet. Um, and um, there's a couple of different um, graphics to sort of show where we are. Um, if you all have been around, right at the point of the peninsula is um, Kelly Point Park. That's a, a park right at the, at the tip of the peninsula. And so Terminal 6 is a long marine drive between there and then the I-5 is here. So the I-5 bridge is right there. Oops. I'm freezing up here. Lacey, can I ask for help with the... So today's talk actually doesn't have a lot of numbers. I, I purposely plan it to have a lot of pictures. It's actually a lot of geography and some economics, and it's very much at a high level. Um, so there are numbers. There are, there's work that we've done that I'll refer to, but I don't show a lot of the numbers. Um, so it's very much of a conceptual presentation. Um, so to me, um, being relatively new at the Port of Portland, I was trying to understand sort of why Terminal 6 is important. Um, and I think the Trans-Pacific trade is really important to understand uh, why Terminal 6 is here and, and, and what role it plays in the regional economy and, and the national transportation network and even in the international um, shipment movement of goods. Um, so I, I brought a prop, <laughs> some of you are aware. I brought a prop, um, this, is a little, um, this is a little bit of tea that might come on a cargo container from Asia somewhere. Um, so this is just an example of cargo that's moving across the, the Trans-Pacific trade. Um, historically, the, the Port of Portland also has a significant export trade. So you can see there's a little bit of reference to that. Um, um, potash and wheat and lumber products and things like that have historically been part of the export trade. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the import trade today. So this is a visual graphic of what Terminal 6 pretty much looks like today. Um, uh, I'm gonna show you some historical graphics, but this is pretty much today. Um, so there's um, five ship berths, um, and then there's different parts of the terminal which have different focus. But basically within the port, we refer to Terminal 6 as a mixed use terminal. So there, there's a mix of uses. It's not just dedicated to one use. On, on, there's, there's bookends on each end, which is primarily for, for auto imports and exports. Um, and then in the middle is sort of what we call the mixed use area. And that's where the container facility is. Um, Birth 605, for example, and then you see the yard where the containers would be stored, and then you see the intermolded yard. So here's a photo I found from the very beginning of Terminal 6. So you can see this is from 1974. Um, and the first ship to land at Terminal 6 was in 1973, and, and it was in November of 1973. The ship was called the Shinyu Maru, and the Shinyu Maru delivered the components for the second of three 50-ton Hitachi container cranes. And these container cranes um, would later be used to, to, to serve the marine terminal. Um, prior to that, um, the, they, we had only brought in things by barge. So this is what Terminal 6 looked like at the very beginning in the 1970s. Um, the important thing that I've learned as well is understanding sort of where we sit in the national railway network. Um, so this is a nice graphic. I like this about the North, North American Railroad Network. 
with a focus on where we are in Portland. Um, and a couple of things I would just point out, um, we're actually served by two of the major class one railroads, BNSF and Union Pacific. And they both go inland uh, along the Columbia River corridor with BNSF on the north shore of the, of the river and Union Pacific on the south shore. Um, and then um, they serve a number of these major cities throughout the interior of the country all the way to the Midwest. Um, and let me just point out one more thing about that. If you look at the map closely, there's actually not that many places along the Pacific coast that have this kind of rail service. And then the other thing to note, I should say about the Columbia River corridor is because the Columbia River cuts through the Cascade Mountains, it's actually a relatively low grade going up or going down. It's a relatively low, low grade, low change in elevation, which makes for a more, uh, a less expensive and more energy efficient, a more cost efficient way of transporting cargoes. You can see the other major corridors are in Southern California, uh, the the I-80 corridor goes over the Sierra, the peak of the Sierra Mountains, and then from Seattle, there's through the Cascades, um, through the Stampede Tunnel. So a little bit more on the significance of that and how it relates to Terminal 6 again. These are two photos from history about how the terminal was developed. The terminal was developed with a plan for there to be the intermodal service um, right uh, adjacent to the, the container yards. So that's a key element of establishing Terminal 6 as an intermodal hub. Um, the on-dock rail system was incorporated into the original terminal design and facilitates the moves onto rail cars. So that's not always the case. If you look at some of the marine terminals in Southern California, actually, they end up having to truck a lot of containers, a lot of goods to the rail yards because they're not right at the marine terminal. The other thing is, is that um, in the 1980s, the technology of double stack trains came into more general practice. Um, and so that's, that's basically added to the capacity and efficiency of intermodal, intermodal service. So here you can see the example with double, car, double stack trains. These are the well cars and some of our equipment on T6 um, loading or unloading onto the, the well cars. Um, Currently, there's Union Pacific service um, with intermodal service to, to Chicago. That's currently happening. Um, recently, this year also, um, they started service serving into Kansas City and Memphis. So if I went back and I looked at actually some of the, the, the history and the, the supporting papers and the arguments for Terminal 6, this was actually part of the, the case for Terminal 6 um, decades ago. Um, the argument that was made um, to support building T6 was that um, we would provide less congested operations than other marine terminals. There's room for, for growth um, and um, the flows into the interior of the country would, would be competitive with other ports, particularly for the northern tier of the country, as you saw from the rail map. Um, and there was actually some detailed transportation cost analysis that was done, which showed that um, the Port of Portland would be competitive with some of these Midwest markets, including Chicago, Kansas City, Denver, Minneapolis. Um, so, so this analysis was done. And so it's um, reassuring to sort of see some of this happening now um, with the, the UP service going into these Midwestern um, locations. <laughs> the other really significant thing that I found is that um, we, the, the dredge in the, in the Columbia River Channel is a fairly recent development. Um, so this shows um, the Columbia River. We are about 100 miles upriver from the Pacific Ocean. And so the Army Corps of Engineers in cooperation with the Port of Portland is responsible for how deep the, the channel is for the ships to be able to travel upriver and downriver. Um, so this um, 600 foot wide, currently 43 foot channel is a recent development. Um, it was completed in 2010. Um, and so I went back and I sort of looked at some of the papers. This is an Army Corps report from 1962. Um, and so as of the 1960s, the channel was 40 feet. Um, and so this is actually the most um, that the channel has been deepened for 50 years to go from 40 feet to 43 feet. And so what's the result of that? Um, 
currently uh, we have one uh, shipping company that's called MSC. They provide what's called the Mustang service. And we have, for example, one, uh, one service that ships directly to Portland. Portland is the first call and it goes to Los Angeles and it comes back and they do this Trans-Pacific route um, on a regular basis um, with the Mustang service. Now, previously with the 40 foot draft, um, the ships, the container ships could handle in the range of just uh, 5,500. TEU is 20 foot equivalent. That's just the standard um, measure uh, for, the, for the amount of cargo containers being moved. Welcome. Um, and, and so now with the increase from 40 feet to 43 feet, um, we actually are seeing in this table that there's, that there's an increase in the amount of um, cargo that can be moved more efficiently. And in, in fact, the size of the ships are increasing. So this is just actual, actual records of the ships that have come to T6 um, within the past year, within 2022. Um, and this photograph was taken when this ship arrived on March 9th. Um, instead of a 5,000 or 5,500 TEO ship, this is an 8,200 ship. Not all of those containers, of course, are, are you know, have a destination in Portland, but the capacity is there. Because the channel is deeper, um, the ships can sit lower in the water, and so they can carry more capacity and can be more efficient. Um, so people at the port were extremely excited when the ship arrived, 8,200 TEU capacity. And then we saw that actually the shipping company continued to actually try and successfully brought in even larger capacity ships. So as of August 9th, um, this ship, this MSC ship, MSC ship came in with a 9,400 TEU capacity. So this is the effect of going from 40, 40 feet to 43 feet for the channel depth. <laughs> so the Port of Portland is actually one of the major auto gateways. Um, I'll say a little bit about the autos. Um, these are some historical statistics so you can see um, there's, there's actually only um, maybe three or four major auto gateways on the Pacific coast and the Port of Portland is been one of the one of the major ones. I'll just point out that in addition to mostly imports, there's a little bit of exports. This photo shows the exports, some of the Fords going out to Asia that were manufactured in North America. So this is like a little bit of geography and economics, I said. Um, so what makes a port sort of worthwhile? What makes it sort of cost efficient? cost effective. Um, some of it has to do with that geography and some of that has to do with thinking about sort of what are the destinations of the cargo. Um, so uh, we can see there's sort of a, a Pacific Northwest region. Um, so the, the, destina the local destination of cargo of goods like this, <laughs> that's part of what makes it cost effective for the shipping companies to use the Port of Portland. Um, and so within the Pacific Northwest, there's a, there's a capture market for the cargo. But then with the rail system, then we can bring things over the rail system into other markets, into the Midwest. Uh, we're sort of more competitive in the Northern tier. And then there's also this, and there's this concept of the land bridge, which can actually even go all the way over to the other coast. So for some reason, sometimes some of the shipping just goes over the land bridge and then can go on to Europe. Now here's a graphic that shows an example of what can happen over time. So with the auto trade in the ports of Long Beach and LA, which are the largest Pacific coast ports in the United States, um, these two photographs show Long Beach and LA in 1990 and then in 2005. So this is actually quite a few years ago. But what we're showing is the shift over time. Um, so you can see that the yellow areas um, have decreased in size in that time. So Long Beach and LA have been actually decreasing the amount of space that they've been allocating to autos. Um, and where do you think they've been using the space for? <clears throat> Something that might make economic sense, like more containers, for example, or some other things. Um, but you can see that their allocation of space has shifted over time. And then what you also see then as a result is that some of the auto trade has gone up to other ports on the Pacific coast where there's more space. Autos are relatively, um, you know, take up more space than, than something else that's smaller like containers. 
or like this. So this is a nice graphic just for showing our Terminal 6 container results since we've restarted service. We restarted service in January of 2020 with the SM line and um, COVID hit. This is all through COVID, through the down of COVID and then the bounce up after COVID. During all this time, people at the Port of Portland, we really didn't know what was gonna happen, um, but we got calls, shipping companies would call and, you know, and so we've actually been able to see this steady increase month by month. Um, the other interesting thing to point out is, um, especially in this year, you see this um, preponderance of imports over exports. So this is a longer term history of containers, and this is slightly different measure. Sometimes you can measure containers, sometimes you can measure TEUs. So it's not necessarily exactly the same numbers. But we had a break in service, and there's a longer story about that. But basically, this is when we restarted again in 2020. Um, and then we've, we've done a, a forecast, an estimated projection for future years. And this shows in blue our projection for um, what we call our baseline, our sort of reference case projection. There's a high case and a low case. This is our reference case. Um, and so the, the story that I like to think that I want to tell is that actually, if you remember all the news about the supply chain crisis and about things were waiting, the ships were waiting off of Los Angeles, Long Beach, like 50 ships at once. Um, so part of the result of that has been that some of the ships, some of the cargo has been able to ship up here, particularly since we're able to provide the service. We were not providing any service during these years. So the timing of the return of container service has actually been a good thing, um, I would like to say, for the Portland region and for the country as a whole. Um, and I, I think we don't have like a study to show it, but I think the result is that actually the inflation that we've been seeing for businesses and for consumers would have probably been worse within the Portland region. Like I can offer you a little tea because of the cost efficiencies of bringing cargo in from Asia um, to the Port of Portland. Um, this is just another sort of graphic of some of the same information. The green actually shows the, the high case. And so the blue is sort of the baseline case. Um, this is part of the analysis that we did. I'm not gonna go deep into this, but um, I can certainly take questions about some of this if that's helpful. <laughs> so um, now we get a little bit more on the economic side. We covered a lot of the geography. Um, so these are actually very capital intensive facilities, marine, marine terminals, marine ports. And um, as someone who's worked in transportation, but has worked more on sort of the commuting side of transportation for most of my career, um, what's sort of new to me to understand is how quickly things can change in, in shipping and cargo. Basically those MSC ships, for example, like those, those could disappear. I mean, any, any shipping company can just decide that they're gonna change the port they use, the size of their ship. Um, and the same thing on the rail side, the rail service can change the way they're operating. Um, and so part of that is because um, they're run as businesses and their customers are businesses and it's all driven by the market. So many of these things are very hard to predict for the future. Even these projections, you sort of accept them as just being you know, of, of limited you know, understanding. Um, because we can't necessarily predict what's going to happen in the future. But at the same time, we're trying to make um, plans and investments for the future for the marine terminal, um, for, the all, for all of the Port of Portland and sort of how that, thinking about how that affects the regional economy and, and how it benefits the region and, and workers in the region and also how it might affect the, the national um, economy. And the reason why it's important for the national economy is, as I was trying to show you on some of the graphics, that there's very few marine terminals that can handle these types of um, facilities, these types of goods, these types of services. Um, and then um, we are an important bridge over into the interior of the country as well. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been applying for external grants. And so fortunately, both the state of Oregon and the US government have programs to provide for um, grant opportunities, they're competitive grants. So when the Port of Portland applies for, for grants, we're competing with other ports. 
Um, and so for the state of Oregon grants, we compete with other ports, other freight related facilities within the state of Oregon. We have to make a case for that. We sort of say, well, why do we think this is beneficial? Why is this beneficial to the state of Oregon? Why is this beneficial to the businesses in Oregon, to the shippers in Oregon, to the consumers, to the residents of Oregon? And then for a US DOT grant, for a national grant, we have to make a similar sort of argument, like why is this beneficial for the country? Um, and so we try to think these things through. And in the past year, um, year and a half, um, we've um, submitted two applications, um, one to the state of Oregon for a program called Connect Oregon. Um, Connect Oregon actually, I think is kind of a unique program. I hadn't heard of something like this um, in other states. Um, it's funded, the legislature passed it um, and funded it with something called the um, vehicle privilege tax. Um, so that's um, sort of on the privilege that car dealers have to sell cars. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of a legal language about that. But basically, um, it's a locally in-state generated fund source. And then those funds are dedicated to freight related improvements. So if we submit a grant application, um, we're in a pool of other applicants with other seaports, other um, railroad improvements, other um, airport cargo related improvements. And so it's an open competition on the basis of sort of what case we can make for why this significant capital investment makes sense. So the good news, <laughs> a little bit of good news. Um, so through the state grant application, we have been awarded um, from that October 2021 20, application period, we were notified that we were awarded a grant um, in the amount of uh, about $7 million. Um, and there's our link to our news story. Um, and so we are, as a result, planning to make improvements to Terminal 6 with a combination of port, the port's own funds, as well as um, state funds in this case. Um, and so we are in the process of making capital improvements, um, partly with the resources that this grant is expect, expected to provide. So a little bit about, about that, I showed you a graphic earlier, sort of showing you what T6 looks like, sort of the layout of it earlier. And you can go back and look at it online if you want to. Um, but this is another way to look at it um, with a sort of a enhanced photograph. Um, you can see here the, the ship, the container ship is, is at the berth. Um, and then as the containers come off, um, they're, they're spread out in the yard. The reason why they're spread out is that there's different categories of containers. Some of them are um, going to local destinations. Some of them are going on the intermodal rail line. Some of them are, are different services. And so there's different categories. And so they're grouped, the containers are grouped accordingly. Um, this area was part of what we showed in the earlier graphic as being dedicated previously to auto use. Um, and so what the port is in the process of doing is transitioning some of the auto space, the formal auto space, into space that can be used for um, container cargo. And it's not a simple thing like, okay, just uh, go ahead and uh, start using it. Um, because of the difference in weights, um, an, an auto sort of rolling onto a a piece of concrete or, or something it has a very different rate uh, weight than if you're trying to stack containers two or three or maybe during very busy times as four as four or five high um, and so the result is that you need um, pavement of a different quality a different standard a different strength to be able to manage those weights and also the equipment that's carrying those containers needs to be able to go over there safely so we need to, we're in the process of making improvements to this area of Terminal 6 um, to allow for container cargo service. That, that part of what I just described is what we hope the, the uh, state grant will be able to help us to do. In addition to that, what we're proposing to do is a much larger uh, improvement on Terminal 6. Um, our hope is that the federal government uh, might be willing to help us. We're still... Um, we don't know yet whether that's the case. We're still in the process of finding out. Um, but this just gives you a little bit of a graphic as to what else we're hoping to do. Um, it turns out, for example, the, the electrical system has not been improved for quite a few years. Um, and so we have a major 
electrical as well as pavement um, a set of improvements throughout the terminal, the broader area of the terminal that, that are planned for. So we're hoping to hear from the federal government and we hope we can get some help. So now I'm gonna walk through a little bit of some of the, some of the numbers, try not to scare you away with too many numbers, okay? <laughs> So um, this was some of the review from the reviewers for the Connect Oregon application. Um, and um, I was happy to see, this is a quote of one of the reviewers. Um, and so we're happy to see that folks around Oregon who were involved in um, freight movement and cargo industry, they recognize the economic impact of um, the Connect Oregon uh, project that, we were, that we're, we were applying for funds for. Um, so this graphic goes a little bit back to this. This is just an example of something that might be um, expensive before, but not expensive now. And I'm old enough to remember, maybe it's just me, but when I was a kid, we didn't really have a lot of stuff. And, um, the, you know, if you think about like what people had in their homes, like there wasn't really a lot of stuff. And now, to me, these days, there's actually a little bit of the opposite of the problem. We have like too much stuff. Well, what is that? I mean, we can go to the dollar store, we can go to other stores and things, consumer goods have gotten much less expensive. And a lot of that is as a result of what they call the container revolution. So these are old graphics, but they just sort of show you the difference between um, when you, before you had, you didn't have containers and now you had containers. And the story you know, that I like about this is these used to be carried on horses. <clears throat> so um, before, you know, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years ago, <laughs> these would be carried on horses. So they'd be much more expensive to get something like this. So we have some done, done some analysis um, to sort of support our economic case. Um, and what we basically did, um, and I'll try to go through it um, in summary, was we looked at what would be the difference in costs and the difference in transportation related impacts if there was not the ability for some cargo to move in through the uh, Terminal 6 of the Port of Portland. And so um, like a lot of analyses, there's sort of the base case and then there's sort of the alternative case. So what would happen if we didn't have con containers able to come to T6, if we didn't have the capacity, or we didn't have um, the ability to, to handle that amount of cargo? Um, so what we um, did was we looked at what were the logical other places that the ships would be landed along the Pacific coast. And those would be um, other terminals like um, up in Seattle, um, maybe at the Port of Oakland, maybe even some at um, Southern California ports. And, you know, we do have some information that there are some businesses, especially during all of that disruption during COVID, that um, they were actually trucking things up from the Southern California ports all the way up the I-5, all the way up the coast um, to us. And even some very high value goods were being shipped by, by airplane. It's actually kind of surprising um, that because for the business need, because of the value of the goods, that, and they couldn't afford to wait. They couldn't, um, they couldn't justify the delay because their products or their intermediate products needed to be um, completed through the manufacturing process so they could get to their customers. Um, um, companies were paying for things to be shipped by airplane um, and um, chartering, chartering all kinds of different transportation modes that they could afford to do. So it's a little bit, um, just a little reminder, remember how it was when you couldn't get things um, I would go into the, the Ikea store or someone else and there'd be like empty shelves and people were having trouble because of like uh, lack of semiconductors for the automobiles or things like that. So all of that was what we were sort of learning during some of this last two years during the supply chain crisis. So we've done this analysis sort of show like, well, what's the amount of traffic that would be carried on truck instead of coming straight to Portland? And we sort of projected out to future years. For those of you who are used to doing these kind of future year analyses, this is probably not that different from other things that you've seen. And we went out to future year of 2025. 
Um, and we basically showed the reduction in truck, truck VMT, so vehicle miles of travel of truck trips coming, say, up from the Port of Oakland along I-5 into the Portland region or down from Seattle. So the combination of all those alternative destinations, um, what are the truck trip impacts? What is the VMT? And so that was a significant part of our analysis to sort of show how many VMT of truck trips we're saving if the Port of Portland's Marine Terminal 6 can actually handle this capacity. Um, and so we added up over a number over the 20 year time period, and we end up with a total of this uh, 45 million uh, VMT. And, um, and then we also add up every each year to a total for the reduced cost of trucking. And then you can also from there estimate the other impacts such as safety impacts, environmental impacts, um, climate change impacts and so forth. So that's sort of one part of the economic analysis. The other part of the economic analysis has to do with sort of um, jobs and businesses. Um, the first part is more of like a transportation efficiency economic analysis. And this one is more um, economic impact sort of regional um, jobs and, and other impacts. So this is actually um, a summary of an analysis that was done overall for the Port of Portland, um, not just our facilities, but all the marine facilities in the port um, and not just T6. So it's up and down the Willamette sort of trying to sum together an estimate for the whole region of the, the, the port uh, facilities. And so we show um, sort of, again, some of these things you might be familiar with, direct jobs, 5,200 direct jobs, induced and indirect jobs, impacts in terms of business revenues and in terms of personal income um, and in terms of um, projected uh, state and local taxes. So this number is for overall the Portland um, Harbor. Um, and this graphic shows you, I like this graphics, I like these pictures that just sort of show you what we're talking about when we say direct jobs, indirect jobs, induced jobs. Um, Direct jobs are things you probably can think about, like the longshoremen, you know, warehousing, um, trucking and rail, you know, uh, truck drivers and things like that. And then the induced jobs and the indirect jobs are sort of going out from there. Purchases by firms, purchases by employees, consumers, and so forth. So what I've done here is I've um, shown you this um, total number, this 5199 number again. This was the table for the whole Portland Harbor um, and different categories of different types of jobs, the terminals, the uh, longshoremen, towing, pilots, and so forth, different categories of jobs. And then we have done an analysis um, with a, a really good uh, consulting firm supporting us. Um, this this was the analysis that was done to just show the impact of the state grant project. Um, and so what we end up with is a smaller number, but it's an, it's an incremental number. So we're suggesting that if, the, um, if we're able to complete the project with the state grant support, that we have an incremental um, impact in terms of jobs. These are just the direct jobs again. So then you would add on indirect jobs and induced jobs. So um, that's mostly what I have. I just thought I would um, think a little bit with you about sort of the historical perspective. Um, I was showing you some of the longer history of the Marine Terminal. Um, you know, it did not exist before the 1970s. Um, this particular T6 was not around. Um, so it's fairly recent actually um, in historical terms <laughs> for the Pacific Coast. Um, and then sort of thinking forward, um, you know, what could happen. And there is, there is uncertainty. That's one of the things I wanted to recognize in showing this graph, we, this table and this, 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 this slide. Um, you know, nobody can really predict the future. If, if anything, the last two years have shown us, it's <laughs> extremely hard to really forecast what will happen in the future. Um, and so, um, but some of the factors that could impact, you know, what's likely to happen in the future, I'm just trying to recognize here one of the things that we're seeing now is, um, and this is probably a different talk, <laughs> but I'm just touching on it, is sort of these macroeconomic topics. Um, the dollar is getting stronger. Um, the reason why I wanna say that and mention that though, is that 
if the dollar is stronger, at least in the short term, then that means that imports should be less expensive. So um, even for us as consumers, even with some inflation in the world economy, if the dollar is stronger, um, we might not, inflation might not be as much if the dollar is stronger in the short term. Um, but if the dollar gets to be too strong, then we have much bigger um, macroeconomic things to worry about, whether it um, causes more disruptions in the global economy. Um, and just suggesting, you know, imports, because what we saw during COVID is they're very much consumer driven. Everyone was sitting at home during COVID. Click, 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 I'm going to buy this. You know, so that was very much consumer driven imports. Um, our exports, though, and our, our exports going through the port um, will very much depend on the global economy. Um, how much is the price of wheat? Can other countries afford wheat? How much is the price of other goods and so forth that are exports? Um, and the, the economists who know a lot more about this than I do are talking about sort of, well, what's the risk of a global recession? There are some concerns about that. Um, and so that's a lot of uncertainty. The other thing I would just mention is that um, we're in a cycle. There's something of this shipping cycle. So what happened was um, shipping companies are also very capital intensive. It takes a lot of money to build ships. It's a major investment. And so what a lot of these capital intensive industries sometimes go through is a, a cycle where there's overcapacity because people have overinvested. And then it takes a number of years for that to sort of work its way through. And then there's undercapacity. And so I'm trying to suggest that we don't know, but there's this relationship between sort of these economic cycles and also these shipping cycles that um, could affect uh, what's likely to happen in the future. And this is just a chart showing the dollar. <laughs> so I, I looked recently, the dollar is sort of at its highest level relative to other uh, currencies, maybe going back to something like 2000 or something. So it's like pretty much you know, as, as high as it's been for 20 years. So, and I think that's all I have. So thank you very much for your attention and interest. And I hope you enjoy your tea. I, I can try to do that, sure, please. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, thank you for the presentation. I see a lot of the transportation efficiencies and the, and the cost savings, and, and my mind goes to what may be a parallel of equivalent carbon savings as well. So do you think that there is an opportunity to consider shifting some of the percentage of, of freight uh, towards terminal shifts uh, to actually be I'm, I'm smiling because I was actually thinking about exactly this question. Um, oh, okay, so the question, what, if I can restate it correctly, the question was, um, is there a potentially decarbonization impact of what's happening at Terminal 6? Um, like you mentioned that some of what I was showing was the transportation efficiency impacts, the reduction in VMT from the trucking potentially. So the question, which I think is a really good question is, you know, what does that mean for climate? What does that mean for carbon? And um, I think that's actually, I wanna just say that's a really important question. And I was actually thinking before I came here, some of you know my professional history. I've worked around transportation energy. I did a lot of work with transportation and climate change. If you go back and you look at these other presentations, you'll actually see that's mostly what I'm talking about. So I actually think you should ask everyone who comes to the seminar, like, what does this mean for the climate? And especially with the news, like this week's news, for example. Um, um, oh, now I'm going to get, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to get off track too much, but obviously seeing the news of the hurricane impacts, um, Fiona and, and Ian and um, Every year, it's sort of a surprise when it comes back. Well, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised because you know the hurricane season has been getting stronger and more complex, and the impacts of climate change. Um, um, and I'm I'm willing to say that because I've worked in this area. Um, you know, there's a lot of steps between driving your car and hurricane season. But I think that 
I've been working around some of these things for over 20, 30 years. So, you know, I think that I'm not going out on a limb to say that. So this is the case that I would make, but I would also say that, you know, there's more work to be done to, to sort of see if this is true. What I was trying to suggest was because we were in a situation where we had no cargo service, no container cargo service for a number of years, that it was a fairly, it's a fairly easy statement for me to be able to make. During this period, any of the cargo that might have come directly to our marine terminals container cargo was, was going somewhere else and was being trucked or going on rail or going by some other mode. Um, and so, you know, we were seeing, you know, goods that were coming in from Seattle and Oakland and other places, right? Um, and so I think that just providing service um, is, is an efficiency. It's just a question of how much and then maybe, you know, how, how do the projection in the future. Um, there are some other things, other things we're trying to do, for example, like we're trying to modernize our electrical system to, to provide for more um, um, electrification on the marine terminal. Um, and so we're trying to provide for our own facility to be more decarbonized um, electrification of the marine terminal. Um, but I think that's, that's an important question. Um, and, but I think in general, for the folks who've done more work in this than I have over the years, people do agree that long distance shipping is more energy efficient than some other modes of travel. And then there's different arguments about big ships, like how big is too big, but basically there is pretty clear, you know, you're getting efficiency with bigger ships. And then the same thing we tr is true of rail versus truck. So again, with the interior rail service, the alternative might be the cargo lands even at Portland and then it's truck inland. So at what point does it make sense for the rail service to provide that? And I showed you the picture with the double stack, you know, well cars. So again, there's efficiency in there, um, but I'm not saying that it's all 100% carbon better for the climate, but there's analysis to be done to information that we want to look at. Oh, great. So the question is, if I get it right, what is the status of the container facilities on the west bank of the Willamette, north of the Fremont Bridge? And so I think that's a good question that I really don't have an answer to. But um, let me let me go back and go back to the port and see if we can um, learn something more. And, and 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 I'll let Portland State know if we can get back to you. Um, is there like a limit to how complex the infrastructure in the install to like interface with the bigger support for like bigger shipping channels? Like how is it I mean you before had thought about have there anything thought about if you know that that's possible? Um so I I you know I think that what I can say on this question of the dredge, because there are also environmental impacts and other impacts, um, is that from me looking at sort of the history of, of the work to develop the, the, the transition from 40 foot channel depth to 43 foot channel depth, I'm just amazed by how much, um, how much work was done to analyze that. Um, the Army Corps, but also the port involved with that, other, other agencies, other ports along the Columbia River. Um, the reason why it took 50 years to go that, to go from 40 to 43 feet is because of that entire public process and um, analysis and, and there's economic analysis, there's environmental impact analysis, there's studies and restudies. It actually has to be explicitly approved by Congress after studies. You know, and so um, it's not done 
um, lightly, I guess, is what I'm trying to suggest. And there's a whole record of what was done to look at, you know, why it makes sense or doesn't make sense to go from 40 feet to 43 feet. And so the determination was made to go to 43 feet. So they didn't go to 44 feet or 50 feet. And so for there to be any other um, dredge deeper than 43 feet, I would expect that there would be just as much analysis. It could be another 50 years of analysis and public process before something like this could happen again. That's what I'm trying to suggest. Jenny. Yeah, I think we there has been work that the port has been doing, and I haven't been as involved in this question of um, critical. The questions about critical infrastructure, whether the marine port and the terminals can provide for some needed service, some needed facility in the case of a major earthquake or some other natural disaster, um, and there there is increasing you know concern about um, the Cascadia subduction zone and the potential for a major earthquake. Um, and so there are um, sort of emergency facilities, I think, that are designated by the state. And so I believe that the Marine Terminal 6 is among those uh, emergency facilities that are designated um, because um, certain things would still need to come in and out. And I guess the best example story I would give, again, is in the news this week uh, about how I was just following what they're talking about in the West Coast of Florida, which is where the um, the hurricane sort of came through Fort Myers. And so the question, you know, that the public officials were saying is like, well, when can we open the ports again? Because again, to have um, needed supplies and services coming in through the, uh, through the, the West Coast ports of Florida um, for the communities that are in need. Um, and you can certainly see that's a good example. Like, um, I think the, the causeway to Sanibel Island, for example, is is out of service so they're trying to figure out how do we serve these communities how do people even get basic basic needs basic goods served so it is something that other folks are working on One more? yeah um I, i'm not the question is um whether i can speak to how the floods would impact terminal six Again, I'm not as familiar with that, so I can't really speak to that. Um, I, I can just say that that is something I think that other folks are doing some work on. Um, and, um, you know, um, if there is um, a risk of flood or if there is a risk of um, water related impacts, the sea level rise, for example, um, storm impacts, um, that there are other people who are working on that. So that's a good question. So I just uh, I appreciate the link between freight and how important it is for not just our economy but the global economy. I feel like sometimes it goes overlooked. Um, you talked a little bit about how the ports uh, interact with rail. Can you talk a little bit about how it interacts with truck traffic? About how much truck traffic uh, consists here? Sure, that's a good question. That's a good. Uh, so the question is about how about the truck traffic? What is the relationship between the goods coming in by marine side and the truck traffic. Um, and it's a, <laughs> it's a good question um, that smart people are, are working on. Um, and I think, you know, so basically, um, this is how I'll think about it. And again, I'm not speaking for the port, I'm just speaking personally as an analyst. Um, you know, any times, you know, goods are landing at the port, then you have a mode split question. And how much of that, what percentage goes on the rail, as I showed you the inter, intermodal rail service what say you take autos, you know, so it, it usually depends on the ultimate demand that is my understanding. So if, you know, in the case of Southern California, by comparison, Southern California is a gigantic consumer market. And so there'll be a higher percentage 
of the autos that might land in Southern California that stay in Southern California, like that's the ultimate destination. And so my understanding for the Port of Portland and for Terminal 6 is that um, we're not as large a consumer market, the Portland region as like Southern California. Um, and so the percentage that are actually going on rail is a higher percentage. Some, some will go to the local market. So we have also within the Portland region, for example, we have um, distribution warehouses for some of the auto um, major auto brands. And so Portland region does serve as a distribution hub for the Pacific Northwest. But um, the, I think the, the reason why we probably don't see as many trucks on the road as in Southern California is because a higher percentage of our, of our goods that are being shipped um, do have this sort of direct to rail transfer. That's sort of my understanding. But it is a good question as it grows. I think that's the question certainly that I have is that if there is a growth forecast, then um, you know, what is that, how does that um, percentage of the mode, mode split change potentially? Um, and how does that number, absolute number change potentially in the future? Um, so I, I actually think, I've thought about this question. Let me say one more thing. Um, because the Western region is growing, it's actually a question to me that I have. Um, like if um, Boise is growing, you know, then will the goods go to Boise by, by truck? You know, will the Port of Portland be serving the Boise region? Or do we serve the Salt Lake City region? Or is that coming from the Oakland? Like those are actually questions that I have. Yes, it's in the back. But, uh, you know, especially kind of following the port of LA and port of Long Beach on there and all the transportation efforts. And my understanding a lot of that was driven by the environmental justice communities and the local air quality and management districts were concerned about the coast emission from those ports. And so I guess my question is about uh, kind of stakeholder participation and what are you seeing from the environmental justice community in the Portland metro region in terms of uh, giving y'all? Good advice on um, strategic impact from those going forward. Yeah, so thanks, Hal. No, that's a that's a really that's a really important question. Um, the question is, um, you know, other major ports do see significant environmental impacts related to port operations, um, and I'm not an expert on this, but I follow the news just as you were referring to. Um, I think. Uh, we have uh, we have like an environmental sort of planning process, and we have sort of community involvement process when we do um, major investments. Um, and certainly, we're a public agency, so you know we're responsive to the public and trying to take public input. Um, and if we were to do a major investment, um, you know, as part of a planning process, I think that it's important for us to consider the environmental um, steps in that. And so any, for example, any federally funded project needs to go through the required, you know, NEPA process, the required environmental impact review process. Um, all I'm suggesting today, though, is that because the numbers are like very on a very different scale, um, I actually looked at the numbers recently for comparing like what numbers we have in Portland as compared to Southern California. It's a tremendous issue in Southern California. But actually, if you, I didn't show you the chart, but I made a chart actually comparing, um, like we had like, um, uh, we have like maybe 6,000 containers between 5,000 and 7,000 containers a month, you know, which works out to, you know, maybe, 80,000 or 100,000 containers, you know, a year. Um, Southern California ports are on the scale of, you know, much whole different order magnitude. And so, as I was suggesting, when um, when they don't have on dock rail and their trucks are moving things, the containers from the ports of Long Beach and LA, and going through the residential communities of Southern California to get to the rail yards and then to get out. Um, 
then I think the, the air pollution and the environmental impact issues are very real and the scale of it is, is very real. Um, but um, I think if we're trying to do good planning, we would try to get ahead of that. So before these numbers get larger, my hope is that we would be able to plan for that. And um, part of the purpose of the electrification, for example, um, uh, you know, is to try to plan ahead for things like that. So it's a really important question though that you're raising. Okay. Well, thank you again. Again, thanks so much to the folks at Portland State. Really appreciate the chance to be here.